Welcome to ES TV. It's a pleasure for me. I'm Alaide Keffo from Sarafale Hospital Milan, Italy. It's, uh, it was a real pleasure for me yesterday uh, to present the uh, awardee of the ESC of the Andres Grunzing Lecture, that is uh, Professor Javier Escaned. It was a real pleasure. I think you absolutely merit this uh, because of your incredible track record uh, in both in patient care, education and research. And yesterday's lecture was amazing. You just uh, mentioned what is, in your opinion, the future of uh, PCI in the modern area. So uh, my first question to you is considering all the trial and unfortunately negative trials that are coming out in PCI and chronic coronary syndrome, I mean, the negative uh, courage, then we had the scheme, and yesterday we had the, the revived trial. Envisioning that, again, what is, in your opinion, the future of PCI in chronic coronary syndrome? Well, thank you, Alain. It's, uh, it's, it's a great question, of course. And um, I think that, uh, to, to be honest, uh, the, the result of ischemia did not come as a surprise. I guess that the courage was the first surprise we had. We had lots of doubts regarding this. But I must say that um, since uh, courage to, to um, ischemia, we, th we had some time to reflect about the reach or the consequences of performing percutaneous revascularization. Um, I come from a generation of interventional cardiologists that we thought that we were saving lives when we were placing a stent in the coronary arteries. Well, there were no stents actually, when we were just uh, performing PCI in the coronary arteries. Um, but that has changed. And that has changed partly not only because we know more about the disease, but also because we have more effective ways to treat the disease from the pharmacological standpoint, for example. So we are now in an entirely different scenario. And I think that the big question that comes after um, ischemia is not whether revascularization is indicated or not. Because I think that we are going to continue doing revascularization for a very simple reason. Because from the perspective of the patient, being symptom free and having a good quality of life matters much more than being reassured that he will have the same possibilities of death or myocardial infarction in the long term. And I think that this is the reason why I believe we will continue performing uh, PCI in patients with stable coronary artery disease. The important question for me after ischemia is how can we ensure that PCI is indicated properly? It is indicated in the patients where we can expect that uh, it will bring relief to the general symptoms of the patients, and where the safety and long-term in the long uh, outcomes uh, are very good. That we improve the, 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 that we make sure that we have durable results of the intervention that we perform, the, um, and, and, and that we, we are able to, to, to make sure that uh, the safety is, is very high. And I think that this is particularly important because up to now, the, 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 the concept of a patient with stable coronary artery disease was um, linked to the idea that you are talking, uh, doing a, a, a intervention in a low risk patient. And this is changing because the, the, the risk profile and the complexity profile of patients that are undergoing now a treatment in our cath labs, uh, where, by the way, the only option that is considered in many occasions is percutaneous revascularization because of age, comorbidities, is very high. And if you really embark in doing a PCI in these patients, I think that you really have to do it well. Otherwise, there is no point in performing, you know, um, um, a, 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 an intervention that has, that increases slightly the risk in patients that otherwise may have a good management with, with medical therapy. That's a good point. At the end, we are talking about elective PCI. We are not, uh, unless there is specific subset of patients think about unprotected left main, we are not improving, uh, I mean, survival, we're just relieving their symptoms, and I absolutely agree that's very important in our, in our practice. And uh, do you think there is room for improvement for the quality of uh, the PCI? I mean, uh, clearly uh, there is room for improvement on the quality of our PCI if we are getting in more complex scenario complex PCI, 
not all PCI are the same. So what is your envision on that, on the future of technologies and applicability of technology in this subset of patients and on the education of our interventional cardiology community? That's another good point. Yeah, I mean, there's is, there is lots in, in what you are mentioning there. And of course, your starting point is um, what, what is, uh, when do you set the indication of PCI, which is, is very, very important. And I think that if, you, if we take a broader perspective of the role of the interventional cardiologists in the management of patients with chronic coronary syndromes, I think that we should start by highlighting the role that the cath lab has nowadays in outlining which is the cause of ischemia, which is something that is very important. Uh, now you are the chairman of a very important uh, document uh, that is a, a consensus expert document on the causes of obstructive, non-obstructive coronary artery disease or non-obstructive uh, ischemia, which of course for the time being is, uh, you know, is something that has not been uh, considered uh, by the interventional cardiologists. Luckily, we are seeing a, a transition now and, and I think that your, your document is helping a lot to uh, the community in understanding how to understand that some patients actually have symptoms not because of having stenosis, but because they have uh, non-obstructive causes of disease. So I think that this is the first uh, a very important aspect. Of course, if you demonstrate that there are flow-limiting lesions, by definition, you will consider not, not, only, not only the presence of ischemia, what determines the performance of intervention, but that you expect that with the intervention you are able to relieve ischemia. Otherwise, there is no point in doing it. And what we are learning is that we are uh, not good at it. Because studies like uh, Define PCI have shown that after performing PCI, in about one part, of, and, and properly set uh, PCI with pressure guide wires, etc., in about one quarter of the treated vessels, there is a still limited um, uh, flow limiting disease. So we are not good at it and we have to improve it. And then, of course, um, we can discuss later, you know, the, the role of simulation and, and the very exciting uh, developments that we are witnessing now in this regard. But then, of course, comes the last part of your, of your question. If you embark then in treating patients, you have to do it well. I think that we, we have to agree about this. I mean, you, you cannot compare the results of two surgeons uh, one anesthetist, one, um, all the team that you have in a cath lab working for our hours in revascularization in one patient in the surgical theater with one interventional cardiologist and one nurse, perhaps one fellow working in a cath lab with a packed agenda what you have to do in one hour and a half, two or three vessel disease. This is not comparable. We are, it's, it's, this is bound to, to, to fail. And I think that we read to, and that was the reason why for my talk I chose the word rethinking. We really have to stop. We really have to stop and rethink because we cannot be pushed by the inertia and by the organizational constraints and by the workflow to treat patients with complex coronary artery disease in the way that we are doing it. I hope that it's not too pessimistic. No, no, but that's true. Um, also because we have tools available and it's always fascinating by then the community is not using them. I mean, going back about tools and agility tools, uh, I mean, all the imaging guidance, I mean, it's quite clear we have now studies demonstrating that in specific subset, again, unprotected left main, the IVUS or imaging guidance makes a difference in even hard end point, but then when you go into the community, they are not using that. So the whole point is what we can do as a community to educate our community to use what is proven to be effective. That's another point. You know? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, something that uh, a source of knowledge that is very important, something you learn a lot from is from education, from the interaction with your peers. So if you typically come to the colleagues and you demonstrate that in this very complex case, you know, Performing image was indispensable to understand how to achieve a good result, you know, even to plan, to embark into the procedure, how a plaque preparation technique was needed to perform uh, adequate standard expansion. When you start talking with the colleagues, in many occasions what follows is 
a, a, a feedback from the colleague that is some sort of negotiation. Okay, how would you do it if you don't have fibers? How would you do it if you don't have a thorectomy? And then it's, it's something that then probably the most honest answer is saying, well, if you don't have IBUS and a thorectomy that I'm telling you that is obviously an indispensable way to get a result, perhaps you should not embark in this case. In the same way that if you have a patient with left main and multivessel disease, you will ask me, well, how do I do it if I don't have surgery? But how can I manage this patient if I don't have surgery? You say, well, don't embark into it. I mean, just thinking either get surgery at your center or send the patient to a center with has surgery. So I think that this is the reason why yesterday we were together reflecting in the importance of a change in mindset. Because unless we start reconsidering this, I think that uh, we will insist in the problems that associated with the inertia of performing PCI over the last 40 years. So on that, it's very important, the role of education. Clearly, there will be countries where some devices or tools won't be accessible. I mean, we have to take this for granted. I mean, we, we're thinking about an ESC areas or countries. Clearly, there will be countries where some technology are maybe too expensive. But in all the other countries where they can afford, clearly, we have to push that and also to work, I think, on the education. So which is, for example, your envision of education using other kind of technologies. What about simulator in education or doing, for example, virtual education in countries where they don't have the possibility or people that don't have the possibility then to travel in more experienced centers, which is your experience on that, which is your vision? As you say, um, it may sound like a daunting task, changing something that has accumulated over 40 years in terms of inertia. So, uh, as we say in Spain, Roma, Rome was not built in one day. <laughs> I don't know if you have that expression somewhere. But anyway, so it's true that we need to allow some time. But once it does, once it does, we have new opportunities for education and for transformative education, I think. And, and this is uh, provided by the digital space. And I think that yesterday, again, we discussed how um, our attitude towards the digital space has shifted dramatically over just two years as the consequence of the COVID pandemic. So people have a much more uh, favorable attitude towards exchanging information. We are seeing it in Twitter, but we are seeing it, of course, with webinars, even with proctoring. That, I believe, is a solution for, as you say, bringing the expertise to uh, countries where the opportunities for education were very uh, small. One of the lessons, again, we had from education is that when we move to the digital uh, space, the outreach and the interest of the community in learning was much higher than we expected. At uh, Paris, every year we had 13,000 people at EuroPCR. But now we had 40,000 people attending the, the, the digital education that we had. So the possibilities of, uh, you know, Disseminating this type of knowledge, insisting in the way of performing, exchanging information, I think is very high. And particularly also extending to the point of um, performing proctoring, which is, is, is feasible to perform proctoring uh, online as well. Simulation, I agree with you, is a very effective and cheap way of generating expertise, generating skills among people. Exactly. I think this should be the future and uh, I think also as a community and as society, I mean, we, had a lot, we have a lot of requests in this sense and we should all go in helping also in that direction. Uh, since we have also people here in the audience, uh, I mean, very high qualified, uh, let's also open to, to question. Do you have any question to pose to Javier on his vision of uh, future of PCI? We have six and minutes to go. So, Robert? Yes. Uh, Javier, uh, congratulations uh, on your lecture. Um, I suppose a question I had is, in terms of looking to the future and planning the resources for our cath lab, so we talk to the hospital administrators, the directors of the departments, do we need to shift the planning of our cath labs to the cath labs in the future, particularly for the treatment of coronary disease, uh, need, uh, need to look quite different to what we've been used to? Well, I th I, that's a very important point, and as I mentioned before, organizational constraints 
is something that contributes to perpetuate um, the inertia that has been accumulated over the 40 years. All of us, we love our job, we love treating patients, but we are less efficient in changing the mind of our CEOs of the, of the running hospital, so it's an obstacle for us. But it is true that what it's, you have to change first is not the CEO or the administrator. You have to change first the physician. The change in mindset will happen at the level of the physician, then the organization will follow. And we have a very important ally in this, uh, in this path, the patient. Because patients have more and more a voice that came to us thanks to the digital space. And they are much more aware, look at what's happening, for example, with Inoka. The feedback of patient advocates organizations that they're coming to us and saying, that's exactly what we need. You know, we have many patients that we were in this situation for years, and now we are seeing that we have. I think that this is going to be a, a very important uh, help uh, for us in this change. Yeah. So we have another question. The prior question was from Robert Barn, who is a secretary now of the APCI. So we are working together in this great organization. And then there is another question. This is Vijay Kunadian, again, part of our executive board of EAPCI. Vijay? Thank you very much, uh, Alayde. Uh, and many congratulations again, uh, Xavier. I can't think of anyone else deserving of this award this year. And you know, from all of us, massive congratulations to you. And um, from the scientific side of things, I'm still trying to digest the revived trial. I'm sure Alayde probably already asked you questions, and I wasn't there at the start. And it's one of the studies that the whole of the UK worked very hard, and my institution was one of the um, centers that contributed to the study. So again, following on from the question from Rob, you know, where are we heading with chronic coronary syndrome and percutaneous coronary intervention? My question is, could something else different, say physiology, for example, it's all on based on hibernation, would that have cha changed the results that we saw on Revived? Yeah, I think, thank you very much, Vijay. I think that what you are saying is extremely important. And let me take this to a broader picture, which is uh, the role that evidence based, uh, evidence plays in, in the evidence based medicine that we, of course, uh, like to practice. I think that. The problem is that we, we have a, a very strong dissociation between evidence and practice. Uh, as an educator, I'll give you an example. In chronic, uh, coronary, in chronic uh, coronary syndromes um, with multivessel disease, the use uh, of the syntax score is of paramount importance, has a, plays a key role in, um, in the clinical practice guidelines. When I'm and as an educator, I have groups of people that say, let's calculate the syntax score in the patient before we see the intervention. I noticed that many people have cold feet because they never ever have measured the syntax score too. In the same way, if I'm a tabby operator, if you ask someone, Can you, why don't you eyeball the, the size of, of your tabby device? Why don't you, you, why don't you use CT for tabby? You know, there is no evidence supporting CT use. People will be saying, I will never, ever, the, I will, the, the size of the, of the aortic cannulus, you know, to play a tab, I would say. So you can see that we are, we are in a situation where um, evidence is sometimes, asking for evidence is, is uh, only for evidence, is bonding you to paralysis, not adopting things. And the second thing is that eventually it can never be adopted, which is a major, major problem. My impression is that uh, we need more studies that actually are focusing on combining best practices to, be, to see the effect of what we do, not a particular uh, technique. Let me uh, just uh, mention, and I will finish with, uh, with this comment, the FAIN-3 trial. The FAIN-3 trial, which was negative in a way, is a study that, from, from my view, is anchored on the idea that there is something that is like the philosophical stone, that if it touches, you know, revascularization in triple vessel disease will immediately improve the quality of revascularization. I think that improvement of quality comes from many different techniques that are already available, but if you don't apply simultaneously, you cannot see a benefit of it. So that's, that's in, a way, uh, in a way, a scattered view of some of the problems, the current problems we have now with evidence-based medicine, which, by the way, relies not only on evidence, but on expertise 
and um, patient preferences and patient singularity. So lots of things to discuss, so I mean, uh, despite so many years of PCI, 40 years of PCI, still there is lot to work on and to educate and do research. So we have 50 seconds to go, which is your final words. Well, I think that the, the final word is that uh, we, uh, we have to be optimistic because we have new opportunities. Uh, we have, um, the the, we, have we, we of course will have generation, regenerational renewal. We have new people. And what is really exciting is to see not only how these young people are able to uh, perform or get initiated into interventional cardiology free from many of these problems we had in the, in the past. What is very important is to see how transformative is the presence of these young people in or more senior uh, operators, individuals, who immediately start to reconsider what they do. So my, I think that we, we need, of course, new devices. I think that the industry will partner with the cardiological community, but education for me is the key. So it's still lots to do and let's keep moving forward. So thanks Javier and many congrats for your award. Thank you. Thank you.